In this video, I will cover the Continental, or TCM for Teledyne Continental Motors, fuel injection system. This particular fuel injection system comes in two different styles. So one style is the fuel pump with integral mixture control that has three major components. It has the fuel pump with the integral mixture control right here with the mixture control handle off to the side. It has a separate throttle and control assembly and the fuel manifold valve assembly. So three major components, one, two, three major components. The second style has four major components. It has the fuel pump assembly. It has a separate fuel control with two controls on it. One, it has the throttle side and two, it has the mixture side. It has the throttle body assembly that is attached to the fuel control and the fuel manifold valve assembly. In this video, we will be covering this particular style. Now, it doesn't matter which of the two styles you have. Both styles operate on the exact same principle through a very unique fuel pump. The most interesting thing about the TCM fuel injection system is it does not measure any air at any time. So the basic theory behind this would be quite simple in that for any given RPM of a certain engine, you will know exactly how much air is being ingested into the engine, which is simply a mathematical calculation based upon the cubic inch displacement and the RPM of the engine, how many times the engine is rotating per minute. So if you know how much air is being ingested at a particular RPM, then all you have to do is calculate how much fuel would need to be added to that air to make the proper mixture of fuel to air for the engine. And then from there, the pilot can use the mixture control to fine tune it. So that is exactly what this system does, but in quite a unique way. So what we're looking at here is the fuel pump of this system. It's a little bit simplified, but really this is how it's going to look and operate. So to take a look at the major components and get kind of familiar with what we have here. First, we have right here, we have a constant displacement rotary vein fuel pump. And the thing that makes it constant displacement is that for every revolution this pump makes, it will discharge that volume of fuel right there. So as the pump rotates around this way, it will take the fuel in this cavity and it will inject it out this way. It has to, it's constant displacement, which means that it will displace an exact same amount of fuel per revolution. So if we speed up the pump, we're gonna get more fuel out. If we slow down the pump, we're gonna get more, or, sorry, we'll get less fuel out. So speed up the pump, we're gonna get more fuel out, slow it down, less fuel out. And this pump is attached directly to the engine. So when the engine speeds up, the pump will speed up. When the engine slows down, the pump will slow down. Therefore, you can calculate based on a certain RPM exactly how much fuel is going to leave this pump right here to this point right there. So just like we talked about a second ago, where for a given RPM of the engine, we could calculate exactly how much air the engine will ingest for this particular pump because it's tied directly to the engine, we can then calculate exactly how much fuel this pump will output to this point right here based on a given RPM. So again, that is exactly how this system is operating because it's not sensing how much air is going to the engine. It just calculates it, if you will. All right, so this particular pump um, has got some pretty unique features to it and the way it operates. And we couldn't just have a pump right here outputting to the engine without everything else on here because we have to have adjustments. Um, the pump is gonna have some wear in it. Um, we have to consider the fact what if the pump should fail. So we've got all of these things going on here. So let's take a look at how this works and see where we end up here. All right, so the first thing we have right here is the inlet. So this is pump, pump inlet right here inlet. And that is from a boost pump. So that would be from an electrically operated fuel pump located probably in the fuel tank 
putting fuel under pressure into this chamber right here. So this particular chamber right here has got a fun name to it. It's called a swirl chamber it, because it causes the fuel to swirl around in there. And the reason why it want, you want the fuel to swirl is because that separates out any air that would be in the fuel. That air is in the form of bubbles and those bubbles will float to the top of the chamber to go off into the fuel tank. We'll talk about that in just a minute here as we get around there. All right, so we have fuel comes in, goes through the swirl chamber, and it's gonna get to right here. Now what happens next depends upon if the pump is operating or not operating. Well, if you wanna start in the beginning and say this engine is not turning. So if the engine is not turning, then the pump is not turning. If the pump is not turning, then fuel will come this way and it can't get past that vein and it's too small and there's a vein going that way. So that means this is blocked off. No fuel can get to the pump. If no fuel could get to the pump, then no fuel can get through it to go off into the engine because this right here is to the engine. So this is to the engine. Well, more appropriately, it's going to go off to the fuel control, fuel control to the fuel manifold valve, fuel manifold valve to the nozzle, the um, fuel injectors, fuel injectors to the engine. But we're just going to say to the engine to keep it simple. All right. So because we had this pump then was not working, then fuel can't get through, fuel can't go to the engine. So it has to have an alternate path whenever the pump is not working. So the alternate path is down this way, where it will come to this point right here. And this is just a one-way check valve. So this is a very lightweight spring that just holds a little uh, plate right there and will keep fuel from going this way. But any fuel pressure this way that is higher than the pressure on this side will open up this and allow fuel to flow through quite easily. So fuel is going to come through here and then off and go to the engine for starting. All right, starting. And should this pump have a failure, if this pump failed in some way, then this would be our emergency operation, how the engine would run this way through here. Now, an interesting thing, because we're running off of an electrically operated pump at that point, that electric pump has no way of knowing what the engine RPM is, which is the whole heart of this system here and dependent upon it. So should the pilot need to operate this system off an electric boost pump, number one, I believe the pilot would now have a, a loss of power, uh, probably about 75% power. It depends. And the pilot would then have to do some metering uh, with the mixture control to get the engine to operate correctly. It, it wouldn't be a seamless thing like it would be in all of the other systems. So, all right, that would be how we start it and what happens in the case of emergency. But for normal operating procedures, fuel comes in the swirl chamber and it's going to go into the pump and the pump is rotating and it's going to put fuel out and it's going to come to this point right here where it really has three ways, one, two, three ways to go. All right, we'll talk about the easy way first. So fuel is going to come down here and pressurize this chamber. Now, if we were running on the boost pump a second ago, as in to start the engine, what happens is the pressure builds up in this chamber. It is going to push on this plate and it will close this plate off, not allowing any fuel to go this way. So as soon as the pressure on this side right here is higher than the pressure on this side, it will close that and no more uh, pressure from the fuel pump or the boost pump is going to get through. So that's what happens there. All right. Now, of course, we have this way that goes off to the engine and we have this way right here. So really, we're down to just two ways. So way number one and way number two to the engine or to pump recirculating, which is this way. So that's the recirculating method. And the design of this pump is that the more we allow to recirculate, the less will go to the engine. And the less we allow to recirculate, the more will go to the engine. So that's how you control how much fuel gets to the engine is by controlling the recirculation path. And the recirculation path is gonna come up this way and this way, this is recirculate. But before we do recirculate, we'll finish up here. So the fuel does come to this point and has two ways to go. One way is a true recirculating. The other way is just going to go back to the fuel tank. And this is always open 
And there's always going to be a certain amount of fuel going back to the tank. And when it gets to this spot right here, we have it a Venturi. So there's a Venturi right there and right there. And we know that when a fluid goes through a Venturi, it has to accelerate. That acceleration causes a low pressure area. So now we have a low pressure area right here, which draws out or sucks out, if you like, all of the little bubbles to go off to the tank. So we have bubble free fuel down here in the swirl chamber headed off to the pump. All right. So that's what's happening. This is always open. It's always running. And this goes back to the fuel tank at all times. So that's always happening all the time. You can't shut that off. All right. So back to here, we have the recirculation path. And the first thing it's going to come into right here is an orifice. So this is the high end orifice. I'm going to write that there. It's the high end. High end orifice. And by high end, I mean high RPM. So at high RPM settings, this orifice is going to meter how much fuel gets through. But at low engine RPMs, there really isn't enough fuel flowing through this orifice to really make much difference. So it would be a lot easier for the fuel to go this way because all of the orifices off in the engine are very, very small. So that would mean almost all the fuel would want to go this way and there really is very little regulation. It's much easier to recirculate than it is to go off to the engine. So we have to add something else and that would be this right here. So this right here is the low end pressure relief valve. So it's low end, low end. I'll just put low end right there. Low end pressure regulator. So what that is there for is because this orifice right here is designed for high RPM, we need something designed for low RPM. So this has an adjustment on it and we can adjust the spring pressure pushing on this poppet. And when the poppet is closed, of course, it's going to sit right in there like that. But as soon as the fuel starts to flow, it will come through this orifice, which fuel doesn't really see that. It's just not enough. And it's going to come to this spot right here where this controls the amount of pressure built up in this entire chamber. And remember, as this pressure builds up, then it's easier for fuel to go off to the engine. So we adjust the low end pressure so that we get the correct amount of fuel flow to the engine. Then as the pump starts to speed up because the engine sped up, at some point, the fuel coming through here is going to have a much easier time going this way than it is to the engine. And we need some way to regulate this when what we could do is we could add more spring pressure, but that wouldn't be practical. So that's why this comes into place. So at low RPM, this regulates the recirculating fuel. And then as the RPM increases, this orifice right here regulates the pressure and the amount of fuel being recirculated. So again, the more fuel that gets recirculated, the less goes to the engine. The less gets recirculated, the more goes to the engine. So by controlling these two items, we control how much fuel goes back to the engine. So if we took this orifice right here and on newer style pumps, and by newer, I mean anything made in probably the last 40 years, this is adjustable, fully adjustable. So if we made this bigger, made it bigger, let's see, let's get a, uh, uh, there we go, we'll use white. So we make it bigger. And so by that, we get rid of, let's say, you know, half the orifice. All right, so we made it bigger. Then the question is, would I get more fuel to the engine or less fuel to the engine? Well, if I made this bigger right here, that means fuel is going to recirculate much, much easier. So I will get more going this way and less to the engine. All right, so let's reverse that. And, and now we'll make this much, much smaller. There we go, make it small, oops, make it smaller. There we go, so we don't get much, much space at all. So we've made it much smaller. So do I get more or less fuel to the engine? Well, if it's small, then I'm only going to get a little bit of fuel going this way and a lot going to the engine, right? Because fuel does not want to go this way. It's very difficult to get through that little orifice. That means most of the fuel will go to the engine. The engine would run richer. And again, by decreasing this space right there, we're going to get more fuel going this way, less fuel to the engine, so that will make it leaner, all right? So when this gets bigger, the opening gets bigger, more fuel will recirculate. When the opening gets smaller, 
then less fuel will circulate and more to the engine. And this is on the high end. And then at idle, it's the exact same theory, but down here at idle. So the more pressure we put on the spring, then that makes it harder for fuel to go this way, right? Takes more pressure. We're going to increase the pressure in this line, which makes more fuel go to the engine. And if we decrease the pressure on this spring, then it makes it easier for fuel to go this way, which makes less fuel go to the engine. All right. So that's exactly how this system operates. And so we just have to make sure that we have the adjustments here and here done properly, which is set up with special calibrated gauges and proper documentation. These are not things that should be adjusted in the field by somebody with just a screwdriver and a wrench. It takes um, actually some special planning to do this. So let's take a walk through the fuel pump and see how this all looks. So looking at this unit in its entirety, you see we have the fuel pump. The fuel pump will pump fuel out, which will go to the fuel control unit. A certain amount of fuel from the fuel control unit will go off to the manifold valve assembly and then off to the fuel injectors. But a certain amount will also come out of the fuel control unit and go back to the fuel pump assembly. So fuel pump assembly is gonna have the outlet, it's gonna have an inlet, it's going to have one return from the fuel control unit, and then we will have that vapor return that is always open going back to the tank. So, all right, let's take a look at the pump here, and we can trace the fuel flow through this pump. So, all right, so I've taken it almost all the way apart already. I just kind of finished taking it apart here. We've got just a couple of bolts here. But before I take that last bolt out, let's take a look at what we have here. So right here is the fuel inlet. This is the fuel outlet. So fuel comes in here, comes around, goes through the pump out here, going off to the fuel control unit. This right here is that vapor return that's always open, going back to the fuel tank. And this one is the return coming back from the fuel control unit. So finish taking this apart. This end right here is that low end adjustment. And this particular pump is a much older style uh, model that doesn't have the adjustable high end, but that'll be fine. It would be right here and it would adjust a pin that goes in and out of right here, but this one has a fixed orifice in there. So, all right, so here's the pump. Here's the top. We'll take the top off right here. All right, top is off. And what we have here now is this is where the fuel comes in from the boost pump. So the electric boost pump will pump fuel into this right here, which will then enter this chamber right here. And that is the swirl chamber where fuel will swirl around and work its way down towards the bottom. Now, if this pump is not working, then we have to take a look and see, well, how does it bypass the pump and get to the outlet? So what happens is, Fuel is going to enter through here, and then it is going to come out of here. So this is where um, it comes out of here, and it's going to go into this side of the pump, right? And it can't get through the pump, so it's got to do something to get over to this side. So what we have is down inside of here, there is a passage that has been drilled right behind this, and this contains a little tiny spring and a little tiny... Uh, let's see if we can get that off there. Hey, look at that. And that little plate. Well, the spring is missing, but there's the little plate. So that little plate is going to go right on top of the outlet right there. And when the pressure on this side here is lower than the pressure in here, it will open up this plate. Fuel will come out of here into this chamber. And then it will go right through here and off into the engine or through um, the bypass mechanism. So... That's the bypass right there uh, for when the pump is not operating. So we'll put this back on there so that doesn't get confusing. You remember there's a little spring in there, but the spring is missing. Okay, so under normal operating conditions, fuel is going to enter into here, go through the swirl chamber, work its way to the bottom. Fuel will come out of here, go into, I'm going to put it like this so things kind of match up. It will go from this side around over to this side where it's going to pressurize this area right here, which is pressurizing this area right here. 
All right, so remember, some fuel is gonna go off to the engine at that point, but the amount of fuel that goes to the engine will be dependent upon how much fuel recirculates. So let's take a look at the recirculating path. So recirculating path goes through this little hole right there, which goes through the high-end metering orifice. So this particular orifice here is the one we looked at in the drawing. If we made this bigger, then more fuel will go through the recirculating path and less will go to the engine. If we block this off, then more will go to the engine. So fuel is gonna come out of the high end right here, where it is then going to match up with this over here. So we have this area right here where fuel is gonna come into here. And if you remember, then on this side of the pump, we have the low end pressure relief right there. So here is our, this out of the way. A pop, the poppet valve that we looked at right there. So that seat seats against here. So fuel that is coming from this orifice comes into this area right here, comes out of this little smiley face right there, and then pressurizes this and opens it up. Now this has to fight against the adjustment over here, which is just a lightweight spring on top with an adjustment screw here. So by doing that, by screwing the screw down more, we put more pressure on here, which puts more pressure on here, which means more pressure. It takes more pressure to open this poppet valve, which means if more pressure to open the poppet valve, it's easier for fuel to go off to the engine. So by screwing this down, we will get more pressure to the engine. By relieving the pressure, that will make it easier for fuel to recirculate through. So once fuel comes up, through here, through that little smiley, it's now allowed to enter the bigger opening right here. That bigger opening then is attached to this right here. So this right here then is in alignment with, let's get this going right here, this hole right here. So you can see that it's this hole right here, it's gonna sit sideways, is right here. And then this hole right here is attached to this. So these two things are attached. And so fuel then, once it comes up through this poppet valve, will enter into this chamber right there, which is connected to this and this. And this hole right here is attached to that hole right there. So we're looking to get back to the pump. Well, fuel is gonna come through here, go into there. It's gonna go up to this little hole right here, which forces it to go this way and recirculate and start the process all over again. Meanwhile, Let's see, we got the fuel going down this way. Again, it's gonna come out this way, go back through the pump, pressurize this. It's either gonna go out to the engine or it's gonna go this way, recirculate, which recirculate is back through here, through the orifice, from the orifice. Let's see, pressurize this area. This area goes through the smiley face right here. Smiley face opens the poppet, fuel comes into here, out that hole into this hole, this hole goes up into here, recirculates, all right? And then we also have to talk about the fuel, I call it the fuel injector right here, it, it, or extractor, I should say, bubble extractor. So we do have a little hole right there that gets pressure from down in the swirl chamber. So down the swirl chamber, it's attached there, and then it comes back up through, and right in here, we can see there's a hole drilled passageway that comes through here. So it's right there's a little hole. So when this is pressurized, fuel is gonna come up this way all the time. Hit that right there. That is attached to this hole right there. There's a hole right in there. It's gonna come, you can see it right there, up in here. Fuel is gonna flow through there. Right in here, there's where the venturi is. And so that's gonna create a low pressure, which is right over this hole. So it's going to pull the bubbles this way, this way, and then off out into the fuel tank. Now this particular one does have a pressure fitting right here. And I believe this is the older style that probably went on a turbocharged engine. And so the reason why you would have something like this is because with a turbocharged engine, there is a thing called turbo lag. So we would open the throttle, we would tell the engine to speed up and the engine would speed up because we opened the throttle and we're gonna get more fuel because the engine sped up. But this would be calibrated for a certain amount of manifold pressure, which we have not got yet because the turbo is taking too, it takes a while to get there. 
So this has been calibrated for a certain turbo pressure, which has yet to happen. So if this then suddenly put out the amount of fuel that was needed for a high turbo pressure, high manifold pressure, uh, we would get too much fuel. So this right here puts pressure on top of the diaphragm in addition to the spring. So without pressure, then you would just have the spring, which means that this would be allowed to open up easier, which means fuel would recirculate easier, which means less fuel out to the engine. But when the turbocharger finally spools up and we get a lot of uh, upper deck pressure, turbo outlet pressure onto here, that would press onto this diaphragm assisting this spring, making it harder at that point for fuel to recirculate through this, which means we would then get more fuel out to the engine because the turbocharger pressure was high enough. So that's what this is doing right here. All right, let's move on to the fuel control unit. So the fuel control unit is simple yet complicated, like just about everything, right? All right, so to start with, we have fuel comes in right here. So this just came in from the fuel pump and it's gonna come down through here across a screen, do its work inside of here, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And then we have two ports. We have one port that is gonna go back, fuel return back to the pump, at which we showed a little bit ago. And then this will go out to the manifold valve assembly. So let's open it up and take a look at the parts inside. And I've already pulled out the pins and everything to make it quite easy to come apart. So we'll just pull these two levers out right here. And then we have one screw right here that holds a assembly inside there. So we'll push that out with something soft and plastic and that's gonna come out and sit right there. And then I'll pull this out. And this is our screen, which we're gonna check every annual, every 100 hours, make sure that we don't have any debris built up along here because when this plugs up, it will plug this up and the engine stops working. So very important uh, that we don't have that problem. Okay, so taking a look at this, we know that fuel is going to come in through here, go down through the screen and out here, and then up. And once it goes up, it's going to enter this chamber right here. Now, this is kind of a, an interesting thing right here because uh, this chamber goes all the way around. So if we look at the drawing right here, you'll see that it isn't drawn quite quite correctly. It indicates that there's just one little path for fuel here and somehow we've got this red line here and it's like, where did that come from? So looking back at the shaft right here, you'll see that the reason why is because the shaft is cut out all the way around and there are two outlets. So fuel is gonna come in through the pressure. It's gonna pressurize this area and it's gonna go out either through this hole, which is right there, or we have this passage, which is drilled right here. All right, so this right here is held by spring pressure against this plug in the middle. And if we look at these three holes here, we're gonna see that this one right down here, so we'll look at referencing the screw hole uh, right here, and there's a little bar inside of there, which is difficult to see. But this right here is a check valve allowing fuel to go only one way. This one right here allows fuel to come up through this hole right here. So it goes in this way and out that way. And this particular hole right here goes straight through onto that one. And then this hole right here comes right through to that one. So this right here is the hole that's gonna go out towards the engine. This is the check one. And this one is the return back to the pump. So when we look at this right here and line it all up, we can see that this has an eccentric uh, circle to it. It's not a perfect circle. You can see this is a perfect circle right here, and you can see that it's smaller right here and it gets bigger over there. And so this is gonna line up against here. So in the idle cutoff position, which is easiest to find is the idle cutoff position would be no fuel going this way and all the fuel going back to the pump. Because remember, the pump is outputting uh, fuel, it's going to come in through this way, up through here, through here, and we have fuel here. It's got to go somewhere, and if we were to just block this off, then we would damage the pump because not enough fuel can recirculate through that pump, so it's got to come this way and recirculate through here and idle cutoff. So idle cutoff would put this big hole right there in line with that one right there, allowing all the fuel to come in to here, through here, into here and then back and recirculate. And at the same time, it's gonna have this circle right here is gonna be covering up this hole going to the engine. 
So that would be in um, idle, full idle cutoff. And then as we move the, this way, then this circle down here will open up and allow more fuel this way. So we are for it full rich, then we would have this one lined up with this, allowing all the fuel to go this way and nothing recirculating back out. All right, so we'll come back to this little hole here in just a little bit. So let's say we have it on full rich, which means that this hole, this hole right here is lining up with the one going all the way through, going off into the engine. Sorry about that. This hole lines up with that one going off the engine. And this one right here is blocked off because we want all the fuel to go to the engine. Now, once fuel makes its way through this main metering orifice right here and out the other side, that's actually a pretty small hole. It's hard to believe that, you know, 470 or 520 or 550, that's all the fuel that is coming through to operate that engine. But it's coming through at quite a pressure. Then it's going to come over here to the throttle side. And the throttle side, we can really see that this is quite eccentric here and cut out. So at one point, it is going to have, um, at full throttle, it would have this completely open, allowing fuel then to come through this space right here, and then through here and out this hole right here, off to the uh, manifold valve. Or as this is rotated and starts blocking off, oops, this right here, then less and less fuel would come this way and it would um, be less fuel to the engine. Now, let's talk about this funny little hole right here. So that's an interesting little thing. It's got a little check valve in it. It does not allow fuel to go this way, but allows fuel to go that way. So at idle cutoff, so two things have to happen. One, this has to be at idle. And when this is at idle, this hole right here lines up with the check valve hole right there. So let's see, we can line that up right there. So that would be at this shaft in idle and only in idle. If it's off idle, it's not going to work. So we put that in idle and these two holes line up, which means that the fuel on this side right here is allowed to go into this hole right here. And then when we place this in idle cutoff, this hole right there, that little hole right there, will line up with this right here at idle cutoff, which means that fuel is allowed to bleed from right here through the hole, back through that little tiny hole with the check valve, and then out through here, which then allows it to go back through the return. And so I believe what that does is it relieves pressure on this side of the system so that the fuel manifold valve can close down without pressure and allows it to bleed back through. But really, I mean, that's that's it in a nutshell. That's, that's all this thing does. I can do it one more time really quick. So fuel comes in through here, across the screen, up through here, pressurizes this chamber. And then in, um, in idle cutoff, all the fuel will go through this way, up into here, out here, back to the pump. When it is off idle cutoff and we have it in full rich, then fuel comes in behind here. Um, it is allowed to, once it comes through here, it's gonna go through this hole right there, which will line up with the hole going all the way through, there and right there, which then comes to this side. That side, fuel is allowed to come on this side of that little um, sort of eccentric circle, pressurizing this, which comes out to here, which goes off to the fuel manifold. And then at idle cutoff, fuel comes through here through the little hole, back through here, back through the little hole, pressurizes this and goes back out towards the fuel pump. Um, let's see, so there is one other hole and that's off to the side. So, and really all that is, it's, it's how they made it. So you have a hole drilled right here that actually needs to come out this way right here. I kept saying return here, I think, but this, this and this are connected. So drill a hole through this way and then you can drill down and then this way, and so all three of these chambers connect. This chamber connects to this chamber, connects to that chamber. It's all the same thing. And I think it's just, they're that way just because it was, that's how you drill it in there and get a passage to go this way and that way. It'd be hard to get a 90 degree drill to come in this way and drill out that way. It doesn't, they don't make such a thing. So you just have to drill a hole this way, this way, and this way to get them all, all together. And so that was just a hole that was drilled for a passageway. So that's the fuel, um, fuel control assembly and how it works. If we want to look real quick at the drawing on how it works, so fuel is going to come in from the fuel pump, 
across the screen. It's going to come down in that chamber, which we know is, is uh, cut out. So there's fuel all the way around it in this area right here. If we have it in full rich, this hole right here will be lined up to go through the main metering orifice through the metering plug. And if we have it not completely in full rich, well, then some fuel is going to go through the main orifice right there and some will be returned back to the pump. But we have fuel is going to come through here where we know we have the eccentric circle, which is going to uh, either fully expose this hole right here or partially expose it. So if it's partially exposed because we have throttled back, that will allow less fuel to come through here and less fuel to go out to the fuel manifold. And what is not shown is in the idle cutoff position where this hole right here is lined up with this. And so no fuel goes through here. We have fuel comes down here goes through here and out here and then there's a hole that lines up which we can't see which is going to put fuel all the way back into this chamber which allows it to go through there and then back around. So after fuel leaves the fuel control unit it is going to go either to the fuel pump the extra fuel that we had or it's going to go off to the manifold valve assembly. Now before I take this apart I do want to point out that this mounts to the engine in such a way that it would be fore and aft going this way, and this is set with a vent off to the side. Now, some people might think that that's, that's backwards. You know, we should maybe make this the front or the back of the engine, but the point is the vent should never face the front of the engine where air is, forced air is allowed to come in this way and pressurize this. So you always wanna make sure the vent is either off to the side or facing aft never front. But fuel would come in through this way right here and enter into this chamber right here, which is almost all the way apart. Finish off these screws right here. And as we take this apart, we will see that we have a spring pressing down on a diaphragm and that vent right here went through a little hole right there, which vents this. It keeps this from having to fight air pressure. So if this was facing forward and air came in here, it would pressurize this and want to force it back down, which is a bad thing. So we have a spring right here that presses down on a diaphragm. And that diaphragm, when fuel comes in through here and the pressure is sufficient, it will lift up on the diaphragm, opening up some passageways. So fuel is going to come in through here. There's a screen with a hole right there. So fuel will come from the back side of the screen up this way pressurize, the pressure will go against this, lifting this poppet up, exposing this area right here that's been cut out and these holes where fuel will then enter in this way. Now, the funny thing about Continental System is they went through great efforts to do almost the opposite of what uh, Bendix did with their fuel control. This uh, fuel manifold valve here needs to do absolutely no metering. They do not want this to meter. They don't want any restrictions here causing metering. So what they do is rather than have this pop it as fuel starts to press here, come up a little bit and then use this as kind of a variable orifice. So the more fuel pressure, the higher this would go, the more this would be exposed. They want this to pop it to go all the way open and then when it's fully open, the fuel to start to flow. And so the way they do that is this has to open up all the way for fuel to enter into these holes right here. And once fuel does that, there is another poppet inside of here. So if I were to shine a flashlight through here or here, you wouldn't see any light passing through because in there, there's a spring and there's a spring in there with another little plate. And so when this is all the way open and pressure is adequate, it will pop that plate down against the spring and allow fuel to flow around it. So if we take a look at the drawing right here, we can kind of see what's going on. So fuel is going to come in from the uh, fuel pump, come in over here, I'm sorry, all right, it comes in this way, um, through the fuel pump, and it's gonna enter this chamber where it presses up on the poppet until the big diaphragm, until it's fully open, then, Fuel is going to press against this little poppet that you can see there, opening it up. And then when it is open, fuel will now flow through to the nozzles. And again, the reason why it was done this way is so that no metering is done by the manifold valve assembly. All right, so back here looking at the manifold valve assembly, we can see how that works. 
and we can set that aside right there. We can talk just a little bit about the nozzles and the correlation between here and that gauge that we just saw. So this is a nozzle for a naturally aspirated or non-turbocharged engine, which means that this part goes into the cylinder and this part is under a lower pressure than the atmospheric. So if this end is into the cylinder, and below here is less than manifold, or it's manifold pressure, less than atmospheric, and this is atmospheric, it means there's more pressure here, which will cause air to go into this cup right here, through this screen right here, and then into the nozzle where fuel is then coming this way through here. So at this point, air and fuel will mix, atomizing that fuel for a spray coming out that has atomized fuel, which is um, has finer droplets, more surface area, evaporates easy, and is better for uh, the burn. So that is the screen there. Now, one of two things could get plugged on a nozzle like this. Either we could get a partial plug of the fuel coming out, or we could get a partial plug of the screen right here. So looking here at our drawing, we see we have a fuel pressure gauge right here. Now, this particular gauge says PSI pounds per square inch. But in the cockpit, it may not say PSI, it may say GPH, gallons per hour. And really, you need to think about it, it's the exact same gauge, it's just painted over and instead of PSI, it's gallons per hour because somebody has calculated that at a certain pressure, if everything's working correctly, a certain pressure right here is going to indicate, that actually goes out to the aircraft gauge right here. So we really should take this one and put it here, but if you can just kind of work with me on this one. Um, the gauge in the aircraft is gonna be just like this one that says gallons per hour. So if we think about that, um, if we had a blockage right here at the fuel injector and so fuel wasn't allowed to come out as much, we're gonna create a, uh, Backage here, the package, it's going to back up fuel. So we're going to need blockage, is the word I wanted. We'll create a blockage, which means that pressure is going to build up in this area and cause a little bit more fuel to go out to the other injectors. But because we created a blockage that is going to create higher pressure in here, that is going to reflect on this gauge going to the aircraft and is going to say that the gallons per hour went up when in fact, the fuel flow to this injector, because it was partially plugged, is gonna go down. So this cylinder is gonna run lean. And because there's a little bit more pressure, the other nozzles will take a little bit of that pressure and they will run a little richer. But the pilot is going to see that the gallons per hour went up when in fact it probably went down or stayed close to the same because of that blockage. Now, if we had a blockage of the air screen in this particular nozzle, then what would happen is this lower pressure area right here would tend to suck the fuel in, which means that more fuel would want to come through this nozzle because instead of the fuel just pushing, you have air down here pulling at the same time. So this nozzle or this cylinder is going to run a little richer because it's pulling fuel in. And that's going to rob a little bit of fuel off of these nozzles. So this one will run a little leaner. And because we have less pressure built up, this gauge going to the uh, cockpit would say that it is the gallons per hour went down a little bit, which is the same thing as saying the pressure went down a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. So when you're speaking to a pilot or using this gauge that's in the aircraft, you have to be very careful to remember that that's just a pressure gauge calibrated to read uh, gallons per hour. And that if anything is off, then we have to stop and ask, is it really gallons per hour going up? No, it's not. It's pressure going up. And what does that mean? Or the other way is true. Did it really mean gallons per hour went down? No, it just meant pressure went down. So you have to use that as troubleshooting. In this last segment, I want to talk about adjustments to this system. Now, looking at this drawing, I want to point out that there are four different adjustments available on this system. So we're going to have back here that low end adjustment. Then we're going to have an orifice on the side of the pump for the high end adjustment. There is going to be an idle RPM adjustment and a mixture adjustment. So of these four adjustments, there are only two that you should ever touch unless you are trained. Well, shouldn't touch any of them if you're not trained, but there are two that you should never touch 
unless you are trained, have the proper documentation and proper tools. And those are the adjustments located on the pump. Oops, there's a little pressure on this side right here. And the adjustable orifice is mentioned right there. To adjust anything on the pump, and this has to be done on initial install of a, a new system part, uh, on a new engine install, and it should be done periodically to verify that everything is set up as the pump wears these uh, values are gonna change. So to do this, you're going to install calibrated gauges as it's shown here in this photo. And this photo came right out of the uh, Continental M-0 manual. And so you're gonna install these calibrated gauges as they have shown. And then you're going to run the aircraft engine. You're gonna get it warm, you're gonna run it, and you're gonna run it at the specific idle speed given in a chart for that engine. And you're gonna adjust the low pressure relief valve until you get the proper low pressure fuel um, out of the gauges. Then you are going to increase the throttle to the point where they tell you to increase it and you will adjust the high end RPM until you get the correct metered and unmetered fuel pressure. And then you're going to back it down and you're gonna idle it again and you're gonna to check to make sure the gauges are right. And if they're not, you're going to adjust this. And then you are going to run the engine up again and see if the high end is right. And if it's not, you will adjust this. And then you will go back and you will keep repeating back and forth at high end and low end, high RPM, low RPM, until you get these gauges correct. And then you will then set the idle mixture and idle adjustment. Now, it is common to adjust the idle mixture and idle RPM adjustment uh, for routine maintenance, and you do not need calibrated gauges installed to do that. So let's take a look over here at an actual throttle body with the uh, fuel control mounted on top. And now you can see that this is the mixture on this side right here. There's nothing else attached to it. You have the mixture and that just goes right into the fuel control unit. But on this side right here, this attaches to the throttle in the cockpit. And so when the throttle, we can look in here, that is idle. And so this is gonna be advanced right there. So pulling it back is wide open throttle. That is attached through linkage to this arm right here that we talked about being the throttle side when we looked at just the fuel control unit. So you can now see how it's all tied together. So as I pull, as I go to idle right here, then we have less air coming in and this goes into the idle position and we go into wide open throttle and this is gonna go into wide open throttle right there. So again, it's common to adjust the idle speed. A pilot says that, hey, my engine is idling a little too slow or a little too fast. I want it different. Then it's quite simple. There's a screw right down here that you just adjust that screw, adjust right here a stop that hits this right here. So right there is an idle position. If I want to idle it faster, I'm going to screw this in, which just means that this is going to open up a little bit more and a little bit more and that will allow more air through and the engine will idle faster or the opposite, take the screw out, it will close more, close more, close more and idle slower. But we also have the idle mixture adjustment. Now, yes, I know this is the mixture side over here, but remember inside this arm right here controlled how much of that orifice coming through that uh, the block, uh, how much fuel was allowed to go through that little block in there. And so by adjust, so imagine if you will, if I held this arm steady and I open this one up, it's gonna get richer and richer. And if I close this off, it'll get leaner and leaner. All right, and so that's exactly what's happening. The correlation between this and this dictates the fine adjustment of how much fuel is getting out at any particular throttle position. So if I want to adjust the uh, idle mixture, I would put it in idle. And then in the cockpit, I will pull this back to idle cutoff. And then when it's in idle cutoff, it will cut off all of the fuel and the engine should continue to run for a few seconds, increase in RPM by about 25 to 50 RPM and then die, indicating that we were rich and then it got to its best power, which is the RPM rising and then died. So if we did that and we got, say, 100 RPM rise, that would be way too rich and we'd want to lean it out a little bit, all right? And then if it went the other way, 
Um, we got no rise. That means we're on the lean side and we need to enrich in it so that we get that rise before it dies. All right, so looking at this, if this is in the idle position right here, and this right here is going towards full throttle, then just by looking at the, this is closed throttle, this is open, this would be less fuel, that's more fuel. By just looking at that, then we know that moving this shaft that way is going to add a little bit more fuel. So holding this, and screwing this in, this nut right here, would move this arm down while this stayed still. So it would, this would stay still and this arm would come down. That would enrich in it a little bit. And if we moved it the other way, that would lean it a little bit. So if we pulled the, started the engine, ran it, and we pulled this to idle cutoff, and we found that we, um, had, let's say, a 100 RPM rise, that would be a little bit too much. We'd want to lean it out a little bit. So we would loosen this, allowing this arm to come up a little bit. And then we would try it again. And we'd run up the engine and pull it back. And if we've got um, 50 RPM rise, 25, we're good, leave it alone. Or if we did it and we got no rise whatsoever, we need to enrich in this, which is down. So we would tighten this screw up bringing this lever down, opening up the orifice down in here, allowing a little bit more fuel to go out. So these are fine to adjust without calibrated gauges. You're just looking at the gauges in the cockpit, you're setting the RPM where you want it, and you're setting the mixture where you want it. Now, keep in mind that if for some reason we ran the engine and there was no idle rise, or no idle cutoff rise whatsoever, okay, that means we're too lean and we need to enrich in it. As we enrich in it, depending on where the engine was, this is gonna come down allowing more fuel. That is going to change the idle speed simply because we're changing the mixture, the engine will run better, more power, and it will in fact cause the engine RPM to change. So we'd have to come back here and make an, a second adjustment to the idle RPM down here. Uh, when I'm initially setting up an engine and I know things are gonna be off, I often will take this and screw it out quite a ways and put this where I want it in the cockpit and then adjust this first. And then when everything is exactly, the mixture is perfect, then I'll set the throttle where I want it, lock it in place, shut off the engine and come down here and screw this in until it just barely comes up and touches the stop. And it's, it's just kind of an easier way to do it than going back and forth, back and forth. But so those are the two adjustments, idle mixture, idle speed. And unless we are properly trained, have calibrated gauges, proper equipment and the right uh, manuals, we do not change the settings on the fuel pump. So there we have it. That is the Teledyne Continental Fuel Injection System with the separate fuel control unit.